Set in the fictional world of George R. R. Martin's creation, the HBO hit series Game of Thrones mostly takes place on the continent of Westeros, where the rights of kings, queens and nobles are undisputed. Story-wise, it borrows heavily from English history. The fictional Seven Kingdoms are largely based on the realms of the Anglo-Saxon Heptarchy in the 5th century, and the conflict between the Lannisters and the Starks is analogous to the War of the Roses. In the show, there are many bloody, multipolar conflicts that involve treachery, greed, corruption, betrayal, allegiances, debts, as well as nihilistic attitudes to religions. Game of Thrones also deals with modern topics such as gender politics, climate change, multiculturalism, immigration, egalitarian totalitarianism and so forth. But most of these issues are veiled and romanticized in the medieval context. The only fixed truth in this Machiavellian universe is the geography of Westeros, which is what we will be analyzing in this report. Even if you are not familiar with Game of Thrones, this examination can be viewed as a simulation of geopolitical workings. I'm your host Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. Before we continue, we would like to thank our sponsor Vikings War of Clans, which was inspired by classic strategy games like Age of Empires. You get to reign over kingdoms, fight over resources, forge new alliances and compete in life battles against any of the 20 million online players. So the way the game is played changes constantly. Support our channel by downloading Vikings for free from the links in the description and get a special bonus of 200 gold coins and a protective shield. Now back to the topic at hand, Game of Thrones. Geographically Westeros was inspired by an upside down Ireland, with the similarities being close to identical. For instance, the fingers in the northeast match with the Dingle Peninsula. The capital King's Landing stands in place of Galway. Donegal Bay is replaced by the Sea of Dorne, while Belfast and Dublin mark the positions of Old Town and Casterly Rock, respectively. Meanwhile, the northern domain of Westeros correlates with the rest of Britain. It's not an exact match, but it's close enough to serve as a starting point. Winterfell points to Sheffield, while the Stony Shore stands in place of Wales. The peninsula known as Cape Kraken has parallels with Cornwall, while Bear Island matches the Isle of Man perfectly. Another striking detail is the renowned Trident, which is a confluence of three rivers in Westeros, but draws parallels to the shape of the tributary rivers that converge to make the Humber Estuary in England. To the north sits the Wall. It's a giant man-made object that reflects Hadrian's Wall, but in Game of Thrones the wall keeps out a supernatural race of the undead. Extrapolated from the size of the wall, Westeros from end to end can be calculated to roughly 4800 kilometers. That is considerably larger than the British Isles. Technically, the continent extends further north up to the frozen wilderness known as the lands of always winter, where the undead originates. However, this portion of the continent is not properly mapped and remains largely unexplored. Everything south of the wall is collectively known as the Seven Kingdoms, which as the name suggests, consists of numerous constituent regions. However, each region in the Westerosi Kingdom is governed by a single noble house, who in turn delegate over lesser households, clans, bannermen and subjects. As for a standing army, the Seven Kingdoms has none. In the feudal societies of Westeros, individual lords raise forces from their population at need, equipping and training them as required. The entire realm is governed from King's Landing, where the supreme monarch reigns from the Iron Throne. As befitting the capital, all major roads lead to it. Yet the Crown Lands, which is where King's Landing is situated, is not a sovereign nation. The 1.5 million people that inhabit the region do not belong to a single identity or ethnicity. Moreover, in historical context, prior to the unification of Westeros, ownership over the Crown Lands was disputed by the neighboring regions, with back and forth hostilities lasting for centuries. Upon unification, it made sense to construct a neutral government seat in the Crown Lands since the cultural and political influences coalesced there. Yet King's Landing is more than just the capital of the Seven Kingdoms. It boasts the finest port in the realm, which offers 
unparalleled naval access to the neighboring continent of Essos and the Iron Bank of Bravos. It is this link that enables the supreme monarch to fund most of the royal activities and maintain the overall economy. King's Landing also hosts sophisticated industries such as shipbuilding, metalsmithing, horse trading, etc. And notable sums of obsidian can be found on the island of Dragonstone, but the value of this resource is yet to be determined. On the other hand, King's Landing is beset with endemic complications such as corruption, crime and low food supplies. Plus, control over the capital often changes hands at times of political upheaval. Immediately to the south lies one of the most heavily forested areas in the continent known as the Kingswood. The forest marks the line of threshold with the Stormlands region, which is ruled from Storm's End by House Baratheon. As the name suggests, this region is plagued by fierce and unpredictable storms that make it exceedingly tasking to navigate the adjacent sea. The result of this unfortunate geographic condition is that maritime trade is practically non-existent in the Stormlands. Most of the local 2.5 million inhabitants make their livelihoods by farming, fishing, mining and collecting timber. In turn, these resources are primarily exported to the neighboring Crownlands, making the economies of the two regions inherently linked. The main body of the Stormlands is made up of two distinctly different peninsulas. While the northern portion is defined by its lush forests, the south is referred to as the Dornish Marches. Up until the unification of the continent, this rugged terrain was the site of endemic border conflicts between the neighboring regions. And after centuries of constant conflicts, the Baratheon bannermen in the Dornish Marches still maintain strong martial traditions and boast some of the most skilled fighters in the Seven Kingdoms. Still south, House Martell reigns over Dorne from the city of Sunspear. At first glance, Dorne appears as a resource-poor area. It lacks forests, rivers and mines, with water being a particularly valuable resource. However, upon closer inspection, the Dornish coastline by the summer sea is rich in spices and fruits. Goods like Dornish wine, lemon and olive groves are frequently exported to the rest of Westeros. Horse trading is another lucrative industry. The only notable port is at Sunspear, but it pales in comparison to the other Westerosi ports. As for the lay of the land, Dorne is separated from the rest of the continent by a long chain of mountains, making it nearly impossible for outside forces to cast an influence on the region, let alone dominate it. The arid desert that dominates the landscape is also one of the least hospitable areas in the continent, which is why the native population is restricted to a mere 3 million people. Dorne is also the least integrated of the Seven Kingdoms, with the House of Martell being one of the most ethnically diverse in the continent. As a consequence, the Martells enjoy greater ties to the free cities in the continent of Essos. Immediately to the northwest is the Reach, which belongs to House Tyrell. As the most agriculturally fertile territory in the continent, the Reach is the breadbasket of Westeros. The local Mandar River and its tributaries feed an extensive plain that is packed with farms, pastures and livestock. Although the Tyrells exercise power from the fortress of Highgarden, the city of Old Town dominates the provincial economy. It hosts a large harbor with trade links to numerous wealthy markets and the Tyrells command a formidable fleet that includes cogs, carracks and galleys. Old Town is also a center for knowledge, with the citadel acting as the headquarters of the Maester's Guild, which is an order of scholars who have monopolized scientific pursuits. All in all, the sheer amount of money that passes through the reach is beyond anything that the other regions produce. Moreover, with a population of roughly 12 million people, the Reach is also the most densely populated region and has traditionally fielded the largest armies in Westeros. Yet that power is rendered inconsequential due to the indefensible nature of the land. Not only is the terrain flat, which makes it easily accessible for large armies, but the Reach borders five other regions of the Seven Kingdoms. Six if the Iron Islands across the sea are counted. 
The only way to defend a flat terrain that is flanked on so many fronts is by arranging marriages to secure alliances with the other great houses of Westeros. Further to the north is the domain of House Lannister, who rule over the Westerlands from their seat in Casterly Rock. Predominantly mountainous, the Westerlands is the wealthiest of all the constituent regions. To reiterate, although the reach has a greater GDP, the 5.5 million inhabitants of the Westerlands enjoy a higher GDP per capita and are subject to a more centralized form of governance. What's more is that the Westerlands is abundantly rich in natural resources, particularly precious metals. The countryside is dotted with gold and silver mines, and the availability of iron alloys has allowed the liege lords and their bannermen to forge and equip the finest weapons and military equipment. The Westerlands is also a highly defensible staging ground for offensive attacks into the neighboring regions. The city of Lannisport is the third largest city on the continent and the local rivers flow to the interior of the reach and the riverlands. These ready means of access give the ruler in Casterly Rock lasting leverage over its periphery. However, in recent times the local gold mines are reported to have depleted and instead House Lannister has taken up debt to maintain appearances. To the east is the Riverlands, which at the start of the series is ruled by House Tully from River Run. The Trident River passes through the land and is formed by three major tributaries. The watershed of this river system feeds a massive plain that is home to some 4 million people. Spread interchangeably over the landscape are small holdings, farms, villages, and grazing lands for cattle. In addition, the swift currents of the rivers grant merchants with a reliable method to ship goods to external markets. Located on both the west and east coast of the Riverlands are several ports, with the most important being Seaguard. Hence, agriculture, trade and transit fees make up the economy. The primary vulnerability of the Riverlands is its location. Situated at the heart of the continent means that the local rivermen are dragged into major conflicts across Westeros regardless of their own designs. With so much external influence infringing on the Riverlands, the region lacks a proper central government. At the easternmost edge of the Trident River, the plains ascend into a long stretch of mountains and give way to a constituent region known as the Vale. House Arryn holds the provincial power and reigns from a fortress known as the Eyrie. Unlike the Westerlands, the mountains of the Vale are less hospitable and not particularly affluent in minerals, with the most noteworthy raw material being marble. Scattered at the foothills of the mountains are fertile valleys, which is where most of the local farms and landholdings are situated. Some 4 million people reside in these valleys, including small groups of rebellious hill tribes who reject the central government. The rough mountainous terrain obviously grants the Vale a defensive advantage, but traveling across the land is so difficult that the local merchants have come to rely on maritime traffic to gain access to domestic and foreign markets. On the other hand, the reliance on maritime exchange reveals that the vulnerability of the Vale is a naval blockade or an amphibious assault. Altogether, the Vale, the Riverlands, the Westerlands, the Reach, the Crownlands and Dorne adhere to the faith of the Seven. As an organized religion with an administrative council, an order of priests and an index of holy texts and relics, the faith of the seven plays a consequential role in feudal societies. In the west, across the Sunset Sea, are several chunks of rocks that make up the Iron Islands. House Greyjoy exercises authority over these islands from their fortress Pike. With an estimated population of 1.5 million, the Iron Islands are relatively densely populated for such a small territorial domain. This places a strain on the local food supplies, which in combination with the secluded nature of the islands has likely inspired the formation of a distinct religion and naval culture. What's more, the Ironborn have an extensive need for timber to construct and maintain their naval and merchant fleets. It's quite possible that going into the future, the Ironborn leadership develops 
trading ties with their mainland counterparts. In many ways, the Iron Islands resemble the state of Japan. Whenever the iron-born cannot meet their quotas for raw materials, they force themselves onto the outside world with tremendous power. The policy, therefore, is to ensure that the Iron Islands retain their naval access to global markets. North of the Riverlands, the climate and geography of Westeros changes. It is considerably colder and the continent narrows at what is called the Neck. This area is beset with swamps that make the movement of large armies vulnerable to enemy attack. The only passage in the Neck is marked by Moat Kaelin, which makes it the single most strategic place in Westeros. North of the fortification, ethnicity begins to change. While the southern regions are populated by descendants of the Andals, the north is home to the descendants of the first men. The latter subscribes to a religion called the Old Gods. In comparison to the more common Faith of the Seven, the Old Faith is considerably less formal and is based around the worship of spirits and nature. Even more importantly, the North is one of the constituent regions of the Seven Kingdoms and is ruled from the castle of Winterfell by House Stark. By comparison, the domain of the Starks accounts for about a third of the total land area in the Seven Kingdoms. The North is also one of the wealthiest in resources, having large quantities of lumber and livestock. Yet with a population of about 4 million spread over such a vast area, the Starks and their subject houses are poorly equipped to exploit the riches of the land. Key to the economic activity in the North is the port town of White Harbor in the East. This is where most of the goods are imported and exported from the North. The West Coast, meanwhile, lacks a major port and this has contributed to economic stagnation in the immediate proximity. If a port were to be constructed in the West Coast, it would link to the wealthy markets of Seaguard, Lannisport and Old Town, which in turn would likely rejuvenate economic activity in the North. Another important trade route is the King's Road, which links the northern capital Winterfell to King's Landing some 2400 kilometers to the south. The King's Road allows goods to be carried at relative speed, but since it's the only major road to speak of in Westeros, it is vulnerable to raids and attacks. Yet perhaps what the North truly lacks is agriculture. Due to the unpredictable weather, most of the food is harvested near the fortress Winterfell and Dreadfort, both of which are built over natural sources of heat. All in all, thanks to the Neck, the North has never been subdued by force. But the region is so vast and thinly populated that the native rulers have never managed to truly exercise control over the land. In the show, there are two game-changing developments that are reshaping the course of events. First, the climate in Game of Thrones is unusual, with winters lasting twice as long as summers. For comparison, the current summer has lasted for a continuous decade, which means a harsh, lasting winter is coming. Along with that transition comes a massive army of the undead. The ultimate pursuit of this undead army is unknown, but their military power is without peer in Westeros and they are headed south towards the Seven Kingdoms. The second major disruptive event is tied to the last full-blooded member of the Targaryens who has skillfully gathered an impressive army in the continent of Essos and plans to make landfall in Westeros. To give some context, centuries ago, House Targaryen unified Westeros into the Seven Kingdoms it is today, but lost the throne to a subject house a decade ago. Now, however, the Targaryen ruler aims to assert her ancestral claim to the throne and uproot the current monarch. Her massive army comes with dragons that act as weapons of mass destruction. No other force has such a military advantage. That being said, besieging the capital King's Landing with dragons would result in the heavy loss of civilians, which is something that the Targaryen ruler wants to avoid. Although noble in pursuit, it renders the dragons effectively useless in the struggle for the Iron Throne. So instead, like modern aircraft carriers, the dragons function as an effective tool for long distance power projection, and in feudal Westeros, that makes all the difference. It is obvious that these two disruptive forces will collide. In the aftermath, however, 
Without dragons, there is little chance that a unified Westeros can be maintained. Rebellions are inevitable as geography is bound to reassert itself. If somehow the Targaryen monarch does manage to hold the realm together, she is likely to live long enough to see herself become the villain. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. Credit goes to our Patreon community for giving us the means to produce content like this while remaining independent. If you want to learn more about our crowdfunding, visit patreon.com slash caspianreport. For now, thank you for staying with us and Sarol.